Bismillah, assalamu alaikum everyone to all of the, the, the panelists um, and also to all of the attendees, both through Zoom and through the live feeds. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to, um, to the panel. Right now we have an esteemed uh, guest, part of the Taba family, one of the Taba students, and now uh, he's helping us in, in teaching and grading papers. Uh, Brother Fadl, James Hinton, who's uh, uh, residing in Phoenix, and I've met him a number of times uh, while I was out there, and I was just sharing with the, the, the brothers here. I said, in addition to every all of the other amazing things, his, 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 his study of Islam through Taba, his working in the community, working with the youth, doing outreach, um, establishing his own nonprofit, you, your options unlimited, um, focusing on, on, on people who are uh, in need of, of services and programs. Um, and he's doing a lot of great works, uh, work there in Phoenix. Um, I remember how happy I was when I saw the pictures of, of your wedding at the Masjid. And, uh, and he's got his family is there in, uh, in, in Phoenix. It gets hot in the summertime, but uh, mashallah, he's, it's, uh, there's a lot of barakah in that community there. But I was saying in addition to all the other amazing things that he's done, um, he's a great chef and he makes a really, really, really good no-bake Oreo cheesecake. And we enjoyed that one outside the masjid at Arizona Cultural Academy, ACA in Phoenix there, I think about two years ago. Uh, and mashallah, all my trips to, to Phoenix in the last couple of years, I try, we try to meet up and, and spend some time together. So I'll turn it over to, uh, to the panel and um, talk about today's topic. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Inshallah, we hope to be able to continue as we got some positive reviews with the first two series that we've done. We will continue with this one with Brother Fadl. So Brother Fadl, if you would be kind enough to share with everybody who you are, where you're from, tell some of your story. And what brought you to this point where you're at today? So, um, as I said, it mentioned, I'm out here in Phoenix, the greater Phoenix area as well. By way of Chicago, I come from Chicago, the South Side to be specific. Um, and as we all know, Chicago historically is a very, um, it's a historical location. And so I was born and raised in there. And my upbringing, it was, um, a single parent household. I know my dad was on location. I knew him, but I stayed with my mother. And so the womb, the strength that um, I bear witness to in my mother, it actually provided me with a strength to endure a lot of different things in my life. And so I come from a very small community and they call it Mo over there where we come from. And at an early age, we made a real strong effort to have a, um, a, self, a sense of identity. And so we adopted um, aspects of what Islam was, although we had no knowledge of what Islam truly was, but we were young and we were trying to govern ourselves, but we had a sense of, uh, of self. And so we lived the, the youthful life um, and we were predominantly in those streets. That's why today I make a real strong effort to reach out to those who I know coming, uh, walking in the path in, in the footsteps and in the shoes that I once walked in and a whole host of others who are with us and those who are no longer with us. And so today I make those efforts and those strides by the grace of Allah to reach that target market, age eight to 18, because there was a project, a Pennsylvania project that came about a great many years ago. And there was a determination made then that, okay, at this age, these kids are either going to go here or there. The here or there are the prison cells or further their education. And unfortunately, um, well, fortunately today's topic is how do we begin the cycle of change is, um, is, is vital, is key, is relevant, is going to always be um, necessary. And so, again, I started Your Options Unlimited um, because one of the brothers, he asked me to provide some insight into a program that he could help facilitate with the brothers and sisters in the community. And so I thought, what better acronym than you? Why owe you? To give a sense of self, um, to know that you are dignified, and to live that out and to act that out. Unfortunately, I couldn't be with them at that time because I had prior engagements that I had to fulfill. And so I provided a, um, a criteria, if you will. And so that criteria to this day is what I bring out here, wherever I go. And inshallah, it takes me further. California, we're looking forward to going to Pennsylvania soon, perhaps Vermont in the late fall. And um, your options are limited. It's, 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 
in conjunction with what I've learned through my education, my further my education through the table, um, it's, a, it's a good collaboration. And I encourage all the brothers, no matter where they are, to Google table so that they can get an understanding of how to rectify that thing. Because as I mentioned, when we were young, we picked up aspects of Islam, but it wasn't Islam as we know it today. And so it's never too late if you are responsible, if you are that, then it's time for us to come together as far as um, within ourselves. And again, today's topic, and I'll just share that because we begin a cycle of change within ourselves. And so with the, with the knowledge that it's not just us, it's about those behind us and those who are following in our footsteps, the Lord, the light for those who are blind and can't see because we were once in such a way in that distress. And this is a distress. And so um, as we talk more today, um, we'll come to know more about each other and um, about who we are as people, as men. Well, uh, if you share a little bit of your upbringing, is there anything else that you would like to share just to give some people, you know, just about what may have given you the impetus to take your shahada? What was that like? You know, were you inside, outside, or, you know, some of the challenges, or were you active in studying and bring developing programs within prison as well? So at that point in my life, where I decided to, to um, not play the hokey pokey, and turn all the way around to go all the way in. It happened in um, the year of 2000. And um, it was, I had knew about Islam. And so um, one day I was walking. I was I was a young movement, for lack of a better word. That's what I was. There was trouble. I wanted some of it. Um, I looked for it. But I was being observed by the older brothers in the community. And one day, a young, a, an older Muslim brother, he approached me and said, he liked the way that I conducted myself as far as, you know, being, I had a certain character, I guess, that he observed. And it wasn't, as I mentioned, I was in prison at the time. And so there was no, um, it wasn't anything that he was trying to take advantage of me, anything like that. So we had a conversation. I said, pick a name for me. He said, I'm, I'm gonna I'm 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 give you something. And so within a week or two, he came back to me. I guess he had been observing from afar. And he came to me and said, your name is Father. <laughs> and so I said, well, what does that mean? And he gave me a piece of paper and it broke down at that time. It said out it was Fadil Labi. And so outstanding, honorable, sensible, and intelligent. And I ran with that. Okay, I, I got this, I love this. And um this was in ninety-seven. And so I didn't take um the being serious at all. I had I was still my being was the streets still, the organization. I was all about that life. And um I started to um meet more brothers. I was in one of the, a couple of those um, most serious, notorious, if you will call them, prisons of maximum security in Illinois and in America, actually. And so my neighbor, he said, Lil James, um, come, to the, come to the gate. So I came to the front of the bar. He said, here. <laughs> I said, what's this? It was a Quran he gave. Nothing, he wasn't a Muslim. He just said, here, and gave me this book. So I grabbed it. And I started reading it. And that was in 1999. And um, after reading it, I, I just I just read, went through it. I just went through it. I didn't really give it too much um, seriousness. And so as I, something that me began to change because as the older you get, although I was still young, um, I was missing my family. I really was. I was missing my mother, my, my nieces, my nephew, my sisters, my brother. I was missing everybody. But I knew I had, I had, I had to do this. I had to do this, this, this. I had to fulfill this obligation without, um, losing my mind. And so um, in December, um, the month of Ramadan came and it was um, in, De it was in December 2000. And it was um, actually, it, wasn't, it was in November, born into December. And so at that time of the year, it's like the shortest time possible. So it was like a blessing. And so um, I fasted about the Ramadan and I can, I can honestly say that um, I didn't successfully, I wasn't successful at it as I would come to be further down the line as far as subsequent Ramadan. But um, it was then and there, that um, I picked up the day, and as I mentioned, um, as I am now, I'm all in. I did the hokey pokey back then. I played both sides from the middle, and I wasn't serious. I was going through the Darlings, and um, I was studying, and I asked the Imam a whole lot of questions. I asked him about um, wisdom and knowledge. Um, in effect, the cycle of change had already begun in me. And so I asked him, what do we do with the knowledge that we acquired when we were living this other life? 
He said, wisdom is wisdom. You don't ever do away with wisdom. All the other stuff you can get rid of. But when it comes to wisdom, you keep the wisdom and you grow from that. Because the thing about Islam is going to enhance you. Not, I mean, in a way, it's going to change as well. And so um, one day um, at Tallinn, I was just so happy because the night before I experienced something. It was like the lights had got cut on inside of me. I couldn't wait to tell him, man, because we had Tallinn on Saturday. And when I told him, he just smiled at me and he laughed. He didn't say anything, but he said, oh, he, he understood. But what I got, the light that had turned on, it was fucking awesome. awesome. Yes, it's like, the, the, I understood it. I understood it. And every day, I, 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 I think about that particular idea. It's, it's, it's very free, I got to, but it's about that pressure. And then I started to read about like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and about how when he was first approached by the real Alayhi Salaam and he was, he was instructed to read. And he was saying he couldn't read, he got squeezed. And it happened several times. But the key to that, what got me is the, the pressure that was being applied to him. And as you go into the, the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you see that um, when he told the story to Khadija, the, the, his, like you get the, a, such an intense visual of the situation as far as what he was experiencing. And he is our example. And so in the year 2000, I made the determination that, and in a subsequent question, conversation with my mother, that um, I was a little bit different. Well, a lot of different. I was gonna not live what I used to live. And so it took a few years for all this to happen. And it took three years actually from 2000 to 2003, but I'd like to come on. And when it did, it did. And so as, as, as a man, I know I'm not perfect. And so I have an example of how to be better. And that's the example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I model myself after that. That's why I'm able to go into any community, it doesn't matter where, and communicate. Because Allah bestowed upon us the ability to understand, comprehend, and to communicate to the people. Um, and sometimes, you know, when I'm talking to certain people, uh, I have to talk in a language I know they'll understand. Because oftentimes, if they're not Muslim, they're not going to know what I'm talking about. But I know what they're talking about because, again, I come from the south side of Chicago. By way of the west side, the east side, the north side, and all parts in between. Chicago has made me who I am today, from when I was a young kid to the man that I am right now. I owe that experience. And it enabled me to go anywhere in the world and um, with leave of Allah, not have any fear. Um, but at the same time, being mindful of who I am as a person and um, the idea and the cycle of change began in me a long time ago. And I'm grateful because being able to release that burden, I just felt so good. And um, being part of the organization growing up, um, they were giving us tenants and, and certain aspects of Islam. And we were like brothers. We loved each other. But as time went on, everything changed because the 90s hit and things became more um, materialistic, if you will. And the, the sense of self, um, the sense of, the sense of a, a certain pride of community, those things went by the wayside, unfortunately. And um, we were in the midst of the mass incarceration. I was yes, a victim of that. I say a victim because that's what we was, because the laws of the land, um, they were written. Uh, and the system, some say it's broken, but it's working exactly how it was designed to work. So I can't necessarily say it's broken because it's doing this thing, it's doing exactly what it's structured to do. Right. It's just that without knowledge, it doesn't fulfill. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that a believer would not get slung in the same hole twice. All it takes is one time. But I understand that, again, we're not perfect, so it may take some of us to be on our third or fourth or fifth second chance. You know, it's never too late. It's never too late. And so you have to start somewhere. I'm glad that, um, you know, I found myself in prison for the way I used to behave when I was younger and making all those errors. But I found myself when I was in prison as well. And there's no shame in that. It's an experience. Because some people, they live on high. They don't have the experience of an everyday life, of a normal life, of a life of desolation, of desperation, where gunshots that ring out is like, eh, it's a normal thing. You know, you don't clutch your pearls when you see certain things. You, it's a normal behavior to you, although it's not normal at all. It's something that no child should have to experience. And so... Uh, with that knowledge, and it enables me and, and, and it provides me with a certain fire, a certain strength to um, to share what I know. Because as I share with the sacred, we talk, um, 
this isn't mine. The knowledge that I acquire is by the grace of Allah. And knowledge is to be shared. Experiences are to be shared. It's like a roadmap. It's like a GPS. And so my GPS works. Um, I remember the Shaykh told me before, you know, not, not to take shortcuts. The GPS will tell you there are alternate routes you can take if you choose to. I like to take the long route. I want to see what's going on. I like to and take, take it off the scenery of the thing. So that I, I, I don't miss out on, on anything. I know where all the potholes are. I know where all the trash is. I know where the the um, the district where you shouldn't go. I know where all those places are. And so I want to just provide that information to those who need it so they can navigate and perhaps make a um, a better decision than I did when I was their age because it's possible. It's possible. Well, anybody that has something they want to ask your brother or add to that? Um, yeah, actually, I, I did. Uh, so, Father, so you said that um, you you got the name Father even before you took your Shahada? Yes. I wow. Did. Wow. SubhanAllah. I didn't know that. Um, and, you know, it, since the topic today is about, you know, beginning the process of change, when you said that, what, what came to mind was a, a hadith that is always in the forefront of, of my mind about um, people are like ores, like the old ores of gold and silver. The best of you in Jahiliya is the best of you in Islam if they gain understanding. And so it seems that brother uh, saw something in you, saw like that core, like that you at your core, you have that fadl, you have that virtue, you know, that uh, all of those other meanings that you gave uh, to, to fadl. Um, so, so tell us a little bit more about your thoughts of, of, you know, when sometimes when we talk about the process of change, people think that like, oh, nothing's been happening in my life. No other influence has got me to start the change. I now, I, now I have to start the change. But maybe that change, that, that process actually started even before the person made the conscious, the conscious realization, oh, I need to change. So like in your case, you had something, that person recognized you had this fadl, you had this virtue, this high loftiness about you. And so he gave you na the name fadl even before you took your shahada. So your process of change to who you are today wasn't the day you took your shahada, wasn't even at the point where he, that brother realized that, uh, that fadl. Maybe talk a little bit about, uh, if, you, if you don't mind sharing, some of that fadl, like where's the foundation uh, of what he saw that comes from your family, from your friends, from your schooling, mentors, you know, something that like uh, uh, very early on that you were then able to reach into and say, this is my gold, this is my silver that's, that's inside of me. Now I want to I uh, refine it with Islam. Well, um, there are quite a few moments that I can recall and I can reflect on. As I mentioned um, early on, they call it so... Here in, a, in well, in, in, in societies in general, whether they're in America or outside of America, you have rites of passage, and so oftentimes in different communities and different societies, um, those rites of passages occur with a young man when he matures and he's able to make another creation. So at puberty, um, he 13 years old for the most part, 12, 13 is when it happens. Sometimes he fails at this challenge, whatever it may be. Here in America. Well, I grew up at, unfortunately, um, I got distracted. But I was a straight-A student in school, all those good things, skipped a grade or two. Well, I skipped one grade, actually. Um, our price of passes, um, as, as they came to be instilled in us, although they were false ideologies, were the organizations. You know, where I come from, you had a choice as far as your rights of passage to prove your manhood by becoming a a, a GD, a vice lord, um, a stone. Um, those were the, the black gangs. Then you had the bishops, the council, of Latin kings, um, all sorts of the Latino gangs. Um, and so in my community, there was a book written about it in 1910 called The Concrete Jungle. Uh, up to Sinclair, I think his name was. It, 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 it described the stockyard community. That's what we grew up at. And in that era, area, it was about immigrants, Polish, um, Irish, a few, a lot of Mexicans, but we, and a few black people. And so growing up, there was a sense of community. And um, and again, I mentioned my family. We, we grew up a certain type of way. Um, mother was a single parent, but we had a lot of family. They looked out for us. We looked out for each other. It was a sense of community. And um, when I decided to 
go through the rites of passage and jump off the porch, if you will, um, I bailed into the street life. And so, again, it was alluring initially because I saw the gap. I was attracted to that. And so, um, in, in reality, I had turned away from that which was instilled in me. And um, I oppressed myself in a system that's designed not for us, you know? Because when it was initially created, and we did the whole historical perspective um, through the family research, we researched our family tree to a certain extent. We got all of the lineages. And we did this back in the 80s. And so this, I was sitting in on these meetings with my aunts and the elders in the community, I mean, in the, in the family, and they were instilling in us our history. And so in a short span of time, um, I got attracted and distracted. And uh, I went against my own soul. And I started to do things, behave a certain kind of way. And in that behavior, um, one night in particular, that, that, that struck me, that uh, it strikes me to this day. And um, I used to not be able to talk about it because it's, it's an emotional thing. Um, so as I mentioned, um, from between 1984 to 94, I'll say that's um, you know, drugs were very prevalent in the communities. And, Unfortunately, a lot of our people, family members, those we love and hold dear were affected by it. And so one day I was on a block. I came, I came on a block. It was eerily dark because the lights, it was, it was just dark. I saw two people out there. And I was like, what are y'all doing out here? Um, the lady said she's trying to get straight. This is a true story. And so I said, I, I made a call and someone responded. I said, so she went over there. So it was two of them. It was her and her companion. And so when I went to her companion, I, from afar, I was observing. I said, man, she looks very young. You know, she looks real young. I could see, because she's standing under the light. I see she got a, she got a hair did a little bit. She has makeup on, a little lipstick. And I, as I get closer and closer, it's she becoming more clear to my vision. And I'm starting to get more and more upset. And so I'm asking her, I say, who that, who is that? And she told me, she said, that's my mama. I said, oh. I couldn't, I couldn't show her how I felt. And so um, her mother came back, the one she said with her mother, and she was like, she's pretty anxious. I don't say nothing. I don't respond. Although I'm, 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 I'm raging on the inside. She asked me, do, do you want to do something with her? And so I didn't say anything. But the little girl, she was looking at me. Right? And it's like, I think it was a, she, didn't, she couldn't say anything, it was a mother. And I think that there was probably a plea, a cry for help. To this day, I'm haunted by her eyes because she just looked at me. And um, I wish I would have just, at this moment, I wish I would have said yes. At that moment, I would have said yes because my mother lived two blocks away. I would have taken her to my mother because my mother worked in the community. Um, everybody knew my mother, she was a very well-liked woman. And so um, at that moment, at that time, I knew right there and there that this is not what I wanted. I didn't sign up for this. At the same time, I'm cognizant of, it's like everything flooded in me. And um, for years, this is what we had done. This is what we had done. This is what we had done in the community. And at that point, I, I can't say that I don't bear witness, but I bear witness of what I actually caused. And so at that moment, I saw the way out, but I was so entrenched I was so, I was, I was, I was dug in. My foxhole was, uh, was 25 feet deep. I couldn't get out. So I intentionally did things to, um, you would think, would cause a negative reaction, but I just became more beloved. I was so I, I think in my mind now, like, I would, that was all that was supposed to happen. And so you live with the haunts, you live with the regrets, and you live with the moments that will forever change your life. And that was one of them for me. Because um, I'll always see that little girl every single day of my life. And so um, I don't know what happened to her. I don't know her existence. But now that I know that since I've become an advocate for, um, for victims of, of sex traffic and victims of abuse, this is what me and my wife do now. Um, I know the horror stories. I willfully ignored it then. And um, I, it, it, yes, it's a haunting. At the same time, it's a realization of the behavior that I partook in. And so we were indeed, um, the cycle of change has started there, but the oppressive behaviors that we, 
that they, we, we embarked upon, they didn't stop. And to this day, they still, those seeds that we planted run wild. Um, some may try to say that, well, it's not our fault. But we had a hand in turning that, in, in turning the dirt and planting the seeds and watering them. And when um, we were unable to till the garden as it should be, because um, I, I, I reminded them a story in Quran when, um, when the, two, the, two, the two farmers said, uh, he was talking about how lustrous, how lustrous his garden was. And he don't think it would ever come to an end. And his partner said, well, why didn't you invoke the name of Allah? But it could be that he may send thunderbolts on this thing and destroy it all. And so in reality, um, we played a game that we, that we had no, we couldn't win. We thought we could win. We had the, the, we had the trinkets, all the ornaments. We had all those things that we held dear. And they were beautiful things in our mind. But in reality, they were, they were, there was like things around, our, there was all, those were our yokes. And our souls were at stake, our salvation was at stake. And um, we traded it in willfully. We traded it in willfully. But that's one key moment in my life that I'll never forget. And so, I, as I mentioned, I, initially, I could never tell that story without getting overwhelmed because of the pain. But now I use that pain as a strength because I know that. Um, People can be saved, and I have a weakness for that. My wife always tells you that you can't say the word. I know I can't, but I can do. I can say something. I can do something. And the best thing that I can do is to be an example and um and, and be an advocate. And I will help those who want to advocate for themselves, but everyone has a voice. I guess they don't know it. They don't know it. And so I can use myself as a um, as an instrument, a, a, a megaphone, a bullhorn, if you will, to sound the alarm. And so. Um, I'm also, I've always, I, I used to recall a story about, um, it's one of the last Jibu'ahs, the Prophet Muhammad Islam, that he gave the food by it. And um, it was war, it was wartime. And he said, you may know the story more than I, you can elaborate better than me. Um, he had his arm on. And um, one of the Sahaba, they, they turned the Prophet said, so, Allah's messenger, um, they, 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 um, they, 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 they came to, they agreed to our terms. <laughs> You can take the arm off. Prophet Muhammad said, I never take the arm off. Now, I maybe, as I'm caught up in the emotion of it, I'm thinking of it could have been one of the brothers, but he didn't take his arm off. You never take your arm off until the mission is complete. The in, the mission, was, in the midst of getting ready to go to a husband? Yes. <laughs> he the opinion of the people and they gave the opinion of, yes, let's do it. And when he put his armor on, it was like they started. It's like no, nah, some people try to. It's like well, once the prophet puts on his armor, he doesn't take it off. So it's like no, nah, y'all made the decision. It's, it's time to go now. You can't, you can't double back on this one here. That's what right. that was. And so, and so the decision was made for me, and I didn't backtrack. I was just slow and putting on my armor. And when I finally was fully dressed, the war had been raging. And now I'm in it. I have been in it, and um, it's it's, it's going to forever be a thing of it's it's, it's a it's a soulful it's a soulful struggle, um, because the biggest struggle is within ourselves, and some of us have to come to the realization and the determination that what we used to do is not successful. Some of my brothers who I grew up with are doing the same thing that we once did when we was 14 or 15 years old. We're almost 50 years old now, and so. Um, Alhamdulillah, Allah knows best. That is an example for me and for others to see. Um, we used to do that, but now we're doing something else by Allah's lead. And so um, that experience, it brought about the cycle, it, it, it ignited the cycle of change in me, but it wasn't the only instance. That's just one instance that I readily can recall because um, I was out there in the streets and I still, after that, didn't fully commit to change, although the light had been lit. Um, I was ready to go. I just needed a little bit more pushing. Right. Uh, can y'all hear me clearly? Because I know I've been told that my mic might be a little bit okay. Well, that example, uh, Brother Father, is good. Within example is good. The story, as well as we all know, this is something that, that, that touches the heart if anybody has any humanity left in it. But it was a beautiful example because this gives us the picture within the two contrasting ayahs, one is in Surah Al-Anfal, ayah 83, 
The other two is in uh, Surah Al-Ra'ad, Ayah 11, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in Anfal, he talks about not changing or not re removing the blessing that he put on the people until they have certain things that they change within themselves. Given that, given a, using your example, talking about how you were first raised up and then how things changed for you at a period of time. And then also that alternate ayah in uh, Surah, Surah al -Ra Ayah 11, where he talks about not changing the state of a people until they change what's within themselves. Giving that balance, showing that you come from this state of blessings and benefit and can go to a state of uh, debasement and, and trepidation, but also having the opportunity to come out of that and having that blessing and that benefit bestowed back upon you. And with a lot of us, one of the things that a lot of people miss is the fact that, like you say, this was that moment where we had to be tried. Because you know that, that that defining moment, like you say, it takes it takes a while. Like I shared with some points about my travels last week and how it took me almost four years, really, three, four years before I got myself thinking clearly. And then even from that point there, although I was fully committed and by Allah's grace and permission, alhamdulillah, with the exception of the illness that I recently went through, I didn't miss any prayers at all during all of that time. You understand what I'm saying? And the things that I was supposed to do, I did. But, you know, you had your issues where you, you know, things back and forth, back and forth, trying to make sure that you understand and get things clear as you're trying to uh, tread the Surat al the straight path. And just those, that example that you gave for me, it's, it's something that in terms of what we're talking about now, that cycle of change, you can really see how that affects what you're doing now. Because like you said, you and your wife now, you're taking up the mantle of working against the uh, sex crime industry, which is something very crucial because again, coming from Chicago, me coming from Georgia, growing up in Atlanta, and you know, Ustav Tuberi was in LA and some other places. It's like, we've seen that firsthand, you know, cause like everybody knows Atlanta, <laughs> that's the capital of the South in terms of like the sex industry, sex entertainment and things of that nature there, you know? Other places in the state and even in the area, you know, Atlanta, you can take all your clothes off. I mean, you can do all kind of crazy stuff up there in Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? And it's, it's just, but we have an experience of that. We've seen it. We, we understand the ins and outs of that and how that has really done a number on a lot of the women in our community and a lot of families, and especially the children, because like we, you know, one of the, 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 the downfalls of that is that it affects, it starts off real young with these young ladies, how the abuse that they experience starts off with them. It's usually it's a very shameful periods of their life where they're being, you know, just, I don't even want to get into all that, but you know, it, it's, come to mashallah. But let's, let's try to keep this going. Um, in terms of this here, and just that retrospect that we've, we've talked about right here, with Staff Tuberty, Sheikh Rami, y'all got anything y'all want to add to that? Because we, I want to try to see in terms of how we're dealing with the brothers, what the brother, example the brother gave us, and then in terms of what we were looking at talking about this weekend, how do we actually begin the cycle of change? In retrospect, what are some things that you may have seen or learned are beneficial to people who are going through these stages? And what are some key defining points of that uh, that change that change period? Bismillah, uh, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah. I, um, you know, what, what, what I would like to do is um, because you know, Alhamdulillah, you know, Fadil, he brought us, he brought us all the way in, right? He put put the camera up close, uh, you know, to the whole situation, right? Um, what I want to do is I kind of want to take the camera back out, and I want to talk about a little bit more, um, you know, how 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 we got here in the first place, right? Um, because you know, we're we're talking about you know oppression. We're talking about oppressors. We're talking about the oppressed. Um, and, um, you know, it, 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 you know the, what's happening here in America is a, is a result of white supremacy, okay? And I don't want that to be lost in the conversation, 
And I, you know, I, I want to talk about that. Just give me a few seconds to talk about that a little bit. Um, and then we can talk a little bit about the branches. And then we can talk about how helping people to overcome that, right? Which, 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 which where, where Father is right now. But I just want to back out a little bit. So anyway, um, I read this uh, very, very good um, scholarly article. It was written by um, a Jamaican scholar. Her name was Sylvia Winter. And when she was, you know, um, she, she explains like the roots of, of white supremacy. And so she basically talks about it starting in during the Renaissance period. She's saying that during the Renaissance, uh, be, actually before the Renaissance, you had, uh, you had, you know, Allah was at the top of what was called the hierarchy of being. So you have the very top, at the very top of hierarchy of being, meaning, you know, this is, this is, the, this is the order of importance of, of lives, I guess you could say. So Allah is all the way at the top. And then after Allah SWT is the angels. And then after the angels are what they consider to be the, their saints. And then after their saints is just, you know, righteous people. And then the sinners. And then, you know, animals and then plants and then minerals. So after that 300 year of the Renaissance, ending roughly around the 1600s, which actually corresponds to the beginning of like legalized slavery in this country, um, um, you have, you know, Allah is removed. God is removed from that hierarchy of being and it is replaced by man. So now man is at the very, very top of the hierarchy of being. Um, and, and, but it's not just any man, it is, they have to be extremely logical, they have to be rational, they have to be Western, and they have to be white. And then the closer you are to this model, the more deserving of benefits, uh, the, more of, the, the more deserving of benefits you are. The further away you are from this model, the less deserving of those benefits that you are. Um, and this is what led to colonialism. This was led to the international slave trade in the form that we, that, in the form that we saw it here in America. Um, and this is what is underpinning um, police brutality, racism, bias, discrimination, hatred. And I think it's very, very important to understand that this is the, you know, this is the crux that 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 african americans are forced into okay they're forced into you know living in the worst places in america um by design as father said you know no everything is functioning the way it was designed so what happens is um you know because of this you know being made you know, African Americans, you know, blacks, people of color are made to seem as if they are, are, are subhuman. They're animalistic. And the only solution for them is prison. And then, so then, you know, laws are passed to specifically, uh, you know, keep people in ghettos. Um, and then they have, there's a really, really high police presence in those ghettos. Um, and, and, and for sure, because of the high police presence and all of the police contact, people are going to go to jail. You know, crimes are going to be committed purposely. And then those crimes, like, like you know, just some of, something that our viewers may not know, um, you know, at one time, you know, it's recently changed, but at one time, um, there was a disparity between the sentence that you would receive for cocaine and the sentence that you would receive for crack, right? At one time, it was 100 to 1, right? The, the way that they measure cocaine was 1. The way that they measure crack was 100 because, you know, crack was, was, was cheaper to make and it was distributed in the American ghettos. This was purposely done, even though it's the same drug, it was purposely done because they knew that it would entrap Blacks and Latinos, all right? So... Uh, now we're talking about change, right? We're talking about change, you know, because like Fir'aun, you know, the Fir'aun had his plan. But, uh, you know, Wallahu khayrul makirin. Allah is the best of planners, right? Um, so we have all of these African-Americans, they're going into the prison system 
um, you know, um, but alhamdulillah, they're finding Islam. They're going in and, you know, uh, um, they're finding Islam. Um, there's hundreds of thousands of Muslims and people who sympathize with Islam in the prison system. So I just want to fast forward a little bit. Now we're talking about change, right? So the, 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 the opposite of that, uh, the opposite of, of the scenario that I just gave is what Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, where he's, you know, he said, خَيْرٍ خُرُونَ خَرْنِ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ The best generation is my generation. Then those that follow them, and then those that follow them. Um, and, and, and I just, you know, we are going to have to, and it's alhamdulillah, this is what the Table Foundation is doing. You know, we are presenting the akhlaq Muhammadi. We are presenting, you know, that you have to have the morals, the manners, the adab, and the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as Fadl said, you know, with that, you can go anywhere, right? You, 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 can, you, can be, you, can, you can enter into any discussion with any group of people because you, it's, it's recognizable that this is humane. This is, a, this is a humanizing factor, Islam and the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, you know, I was, I, 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 I um, you know, alhamdulillah, Brother Fadl, I appreciate your story. Um, I appreciate your story. Um, and I'm, you know, because, you know, I was, I was actually born and raised Muslim, you know, but when I was 16, you know, I was enticed, uh, you know, and, and I was in the streets. And, um, you know, I learned those lessons the hard way. Um, so, and, and I just want to mention one more thing, then I'll, I'll give you back the mic. Um, because this is, I think this is an important lesson for our youth right now. Sometimes, you know, like for what I understood from going into the streets from the time I was 16 till about the time that I was 20, um, you know, I made, I made tauba. I made a type of tauba but I did not remove the love of those things from my heart that took me into the streets in the first place. So by the time I was 30, th those seeds had bloomed again. And I ended up, you know, going to prison. But at the, at the you know, when I was 30 years old from things that I learned when I was a teenager, so it's very important that, um, you know, the ummah is reintroduced to purifying the heart. All right. The, the, the analogy that I like to give is, um, number one, um, you know, when you commit a sin, you know, it's like, it's like your house is burning. And when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and you're sincere, Allah will forgive you but you still have fire damage in your house. It needs to be purified. It needs to be rectified. And if you don't do it, um, you know, then, then, then the house can be further destroyed, you know, later by anything, a strong wind. Um, and, and we have a lot of people who they don't understand the science of purifying the heart. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's something that, you know, if you hear about it, it's almost like rare. Like, well, what is that? How do we do it? When this is a staple, this is actually part of our deen and it's a staple, um, you know, of the religion. And so, um, you know, mashallah, I just wanted to mention those things, you know, like where we, we are, you know, there's this oppression. Um, I want everyone to know the foundation of it. Um, you know, we talked last week about, you know, what happens as a result of, of oppression and, um, you know, I just, I just want to finish with saying that, you know, may Allah bless um, all of you and all of us, um, you know, as we continue to do this work, inshallah. Well, just in light of what you shared just now, just to give people who may not be familiar with some of these things an overview of actually how, like the example of the sex trade African-American community and the criminal justice system, how this actually played itself out. As we all know, it was a point in time within this country that having a brothel, being a sex worker was legal, okay? 
1800s, after slavery, this was something that people could do. You can open up a bar and put some women in there and make you some money. And as with most things we know, these were controlled by certain elements within the society, namely the European descendants who came here. And one of the things that all of us understand within the African-American community, this was one of the only ways that we could make money. You know, there were other things that some people were doing. You know, we look at these wonderful examples of some of the inventors and some of the people who may have started businesses as African-Americans early on in those periods. And those examples were, they had quite a number of examples like that that we can look to. But at the same time, a lot of times people think that it was just this open system like we have now where businesses were flourishing and people were just coming and going as they please, spending money with any and everybody. And that wasn't the case. Our businesses were contained within our communities and we spent our money amongst ourselves. This is another thing that we can talk about later on, even in terms of regaining financial independence, because this is something that came about as a result of integration. Although the understanding of what was trying to be achieved was noble and, and, and beneficial, it was also something that was very detrimental to our community as a whole, because it took away our ability to be distinct. You see what I'm saying? And I have, with the work that I do, with Tabor and with other things that I do in the community, it's a big thing with me where people talk about integration projects because I don't want to be get integrated into nobody's system because that means I have to give up some of myself in order to be a part of what you got going on, okay? I would much rather be uh, involved within what you're doing, so to speak, uh, the word slips me right now, even though I use it all the time and tell people about it. But uh, going back to the situation, it's like, so these were things that people were doing, but at the time, after a particular period of time, as with other things within this country, the sex trade was outlawed. And that left us on the fringes of society again, because again, we were able to make money and be respectable within the confines of this society and what they turned to be something that was a respectable trade. So now it became a criminal trade. But at the same time, just like within drugs, just like how we talked about last week, how they would emasculate the men and tear down the family structures, this was something that, again, being used as a weapon, so to speak. Because, again, we all know the, 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 the filth of this particular trade. Okay, particularly if you've had a chance to experience it from the other side, you know how foul it is. So just to give context to that, just wanted to share that because you shared some things about the criminal justice and the white supremacy. So I wanted people to get that, that visual. I don't want to really get into all much more detail because we don't need to be talking about that on here because this is not the platform for that kind of uh, imagery, so to speak. So we're going to keep the conversation moving. Uh, but again, going back to the, the original question, in that retrospective sense, what are some of the defining first steps that we need to take in order to initiate this process of change? Because even like you shared, Brother Tobi, about the spiritual purification. Okay, we're going to do this. We're going to purify ourselves. But then there's another thing, even as Muslims, that we have to remember, speaking from within the context of being mukallaf, being responsible, and having an obligation to have a certain mind state in order to enter into walking that spiritual path. Because traditionally, within traditional studies and circles, a person who doesn't take the responsibility upon themselves to learn their individual obligations, their I ain't, the teachers of the dean would not allow you, it would be very strongly discouraged from you taking that spiritual path. So I would proffer being educated and all that. One of the first steps we have to do is that we have to, as we all know, we have to correct our understanding of belief. Okay? And, you know, that's the magic word that a lot of people don't like to hear, but that's having a sound belief system, a sound creed, akira, that allows you to think clearly. Because even in terms of some of the things that we're dealing with right now, what we're talking about, it, re it delves into the realm of akira. Because now we're talking about a person's ability to carry out actions, the person's responsibility. We're talking about a person's acquisition 
of those actions after the decision was made in the law manifest this at the limbs of the person in question or the people in question. Uh, we're also talking about having to uh, recognize, and all of us have not given that thought to that either, is that in terms of people and practices of uh, uh, for his things of filth and, and uh, foul and lewd deeds and actions, these things are supposed to be hated to us. And it's talked about within the books of Akira. Okay? So even going back to talking about oppression and, and getting people to focus on changing themselves, we have to remember, again, it, it, always go, it all goes back to that, that state of mind that we're in. Because even like a lost son of what Dallas tells us, again, going back to Sarasa and Fowl, he will not remove the blessings that he bestowed upon the people until they changed what was it, until the people made a change within themselves in order to warrant that blessing being removed. And then going back to the Surah al he will not change the condition of a people in terms of how their state is and whatever's going through, whether it's a hardship or anything, until they change what was in themselves. Going back to the example of Brother Khalid or yours or mine or any other Tabor student or other Muslims who are not Tabor students, just people in general who get about have one turn of path in life and then they manage to change and walk another path. It all resulted as a result of a decision that was made. Because like the brother said, it took him some years after he took a shahad and did this. That wasn't the magic moment. That was the beginning of that path, but that wasn't the moment because like he said, it took him some time. It took me some time. You know? And thinking about the steps because sometimes people will see this and they'll be like, well, and as we know, and we've seen because we've had issues within our community with people who take to the spiritual path. And unfortunately, it really comes back down to those of us who have been most abused by the spiritual abuse and, and, and harms and, and miscreants that are out there. It comes as a result of lack of understanding and knowledge of our religion, first and foremost, but it also comes as a lack of our inability to have firm convictions and stances that we take in terms of what it is that we should and should not be doing. So I think I've talked enough, so somebody comment on that. Alhamdulillah. Um, what the Bari had, what he mentioned about um, a disdain, these are the conversations that we used to have amongst each other. And so um, one of the brothers, he was given a, a fiery football from the North Press over one day, and he was said exactly what you just said. You have to but he took it a step further. He said, you have to build up, some, uh, in essence, a hatred for what you used to do because you know what it was and to totally remove it from yourself. But you can only do that by fully submitting to Allah. And um, earlier today, I was thinking about um, historical perspectives. And the, and the brother, you mentioned um, Sylvia Winter and her writing and the Renaissance. Right quick, because I meant to ask him earlier. That's Sylvia Winter with a W? W Y N? Yeah. So we don't want to with her work. Okay, thank you. And so um before we got to the Renaissance, there was the Dark Ages. You see. And um when the Renaissance came about, they leave out a lot of historically speaking, they leave a lot of key elements I left out as far as who were those who helped bring about this light. Where did they come from? What did they bring? How did they help instill this renaissance, this rebirth, if you will, from coming out of the dark ages? And a lot of those, um, how can I say, those, those pilgrims, if you will, came from different lands. And in those lands, where they came from, the majority of them, they came with the message of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they went and helped those people in those, in those European lands who were having issues with the bubonic plague, and they didn't know how to properly deliver children during childbirth. So they would talk the voodoo, and it's in, it's in effect today. And each and every hospital that we go into is a form of it. And so um, that's just a, a, a short take on the, um, the dark ages and the renaissance. And so in our lives and in this country, yes, there's a dark period, a very dark period. And so um, initially, as I mentioned earlier, the system is, is working as it was designed because initially it wasn't designed for those who look like us. And so um, we were given little pockets and we were given scraps and we became accustomed to those little pockets and those little scraps. We made the most of them. 
But that's not what Allah has for us. Allah has what we need to be successful. And so, um, as you mentioned, Allah will not change the condition of the people. All the good that's provided for us, it's there. If we get outside of ourselves, Allah clearly warns us that if you revert back to your sin, I will revert back to my punishment, whatever that may be. And I'm cognizant of that. And so what I used to do, um, I'm never going back to doing that. That's a, that's a conscious choice that I made. And another um, reflection, if you will, is when I went to Jumu'ah prayer service one day. And in this service were some men who I knew from our former days in the streets running wild. Um, we were actually enemies. And yet when it came time for the salah, <laughs> you know, the brothers said, he, he made, we had to make sure our souls was together. And so I'm, I, I was just thinking like, man, four or five years ago, we saw each other in the streets. Wouldn't, wouldn't have been no, no, no peaceful greetings, no hugging, no none of that. A lot brought us together. And so that was furthering, further strengthening my decision as far as I knew what I was doing with the right thing. I felt it on the inside. And um, experiencing oppression and changing while experiencing oppression and in essence being an oppressor um, it's a daunting task. And so when you make the determination that um, I want to do better, I want to be more than what I am now, it does indeed call for a 100%. I won't say 360 because if you do a 360, you're going to end up back in the same spot. You have to leave that where it's set. You have to do a, a total mind shift. And you have to come to an understanding of what is important to you. You know, for the brothers and sisters that's um, incarcerated, um, do you want to come home better or do you want to remain the same, you know, the status quo? I know many men who did 20 plus years in prison and went home without obtaining a GED. Um, doesn't make them bad people. It's a decision they made. And for those who observed it, they observed it. And you can do a comparison. Where are those men as opposed to the brothers, the men and the women who make efforts inside those, um, those dungeons, those institutions, those warehouses, who made decisions that they want to be better. Because inside these warehouses, in these prisons, in these correctional facilities, um, oppression is extreme. Because I think the Sheikh mentioned it in the last talk, the last series, the last um, talk about the oppressor and the oppressed, about the prison complex, how you have those making um, $1.25 is considered good money. So your stipend may be very small compared to the others who don't have these um, available abilities to get this this money. So you may have people living off ten dollars a month, some live off one hundred fifty dollars a month. But for the brother or the sister that has to live off ten dollars a month, their mentality, if they haven't made the a decision to do a mind shift, they're going to revert back to their old ways. They're going to get it how they got to get it. They're going to do some stiff. They're going to do some canal. It's going to do some underhand dirty rap plays. This is that world, and so oppression is real. And then they have to deal with the staff who come, some staff, not all staff, they come through the door that is us against them. It's us against y'all. And so I had many conversations um, when I came to be in my right state of mind. Um, and when I would be confronted with the opportunity to engage in those who I knew hated me, not only because I was black, but because I was where I was at. And in their mind, you deserve this. So I would have to educate them. And I would share with them that, um, You've been given the opportunity to be successful in a system that's predicated on um, getting fat off the labor and the, 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 um, the sorrow, the pain of one who is considered less than you. And now, as opposed to just coming in here as a tyrant and as a presser, because everyone in prison has already been um, adjudicated, they received their sentences, they either have an outdate, a day of release, or they don't. Um, the security guards um, and corrections are not there to be adjudicators of a crime that's already been adjudicated. They have their sentence, but yet and still, they still further keep on to the sentence of the man or the woman that's incarcerated. And so I would share with them, as opposed to taking this position, because as you can see, we are not who we used to be. A, a thank you may be in order for giving you the opportunity to provide for your family, as I have not had the opportunity to provide for my family because of the decisions that I made. I'm on the right track. This is where I'm going. And they're going with me. So we would appreciate you not getting our way and impeding our progress as we make an effort to go worship a lot. And these are some of the conversations I would have to have, I would have on Juma 
because every Zoom, all of a sudden the microphones don't work, the intercom system don't work, don't nobody know what time they're having it. Oh, it got canceled. Now, we're going to have Zoom one way or another because we want to respond. Like, Y'all going to let us go out here, come together collectively. We just want to say a few, a, a few short, hey, yes, make us a lot, and we're going to be done with it. But you're not going to impede um, and us worshiping a lot, with all due respect. And so this is how we had to communicate with them because in our, in our, um, in our rational mind, at the forefront, we were able to deal with um, not only the oppressive acts that we did, which caused us to be what we were, but we're, we have a crystal clear understanding of the oppressor. Now, everybody doesn't have this understanding. That's why um, when Allah says in the Quran that let there be a party amongst you that stands for what is right, for being what is wrong, um, by his lead, like we didn't say, well, we're going to do this, that, and other. It just happened to be that way. Um, it, it was instilled in our heart from what we come to know about Prophet Muhammad and all the other messengers and all those who had, um, particularly Musa, who, as you mentioned earlier about going to the Faun and how he had, he was just so puffed up with pride. He was just, you know, he said he was going to build a ladder and go talk to his God. <laughs> this, this is his position. And so we, we see those people today, those puffed up with pride who want to build a ladder, I think they can talk, talk to a lot. And it comes out in their behavior. They're so full of themselves. They think it's fine to throw us on the ground and throw the knees on our necks. We tell them that we need some assistance. They forcefully still won't remove it. So this is the oppression in such a way that we have to deal with for our, well, in my lifetime, it's been that way. And so I've done research, I've done study, and it's been that way for quite a long time. Because at the end of slavery, the former slave owners needed an outlet to recoup their losses due to this, um, this free labor they had. And so, um, before that even came to end with the civil war going on and all that, you had a police force that was already put in place to apprehend runaway slaves. And it culminated, if you will, up north in, I think, Ohio, with the Bella Dred Scott and how they were going back and forth with the Missouri, um, the state of Missouri, rather. And so for those who do their research and study, um, oppression is a serious matter. It's not just words people throwing out. Um, because the system is what it is. And we think that um, for those who don't, who don't, it doesn't apply to, it doesn't apply to, but the system is what it is. There's privilege for some and there's um, anxiety and distress for others. And so for those who get a little relief, um, it's very difficult, particularly for black men who represent only 6.6% of the population here in America. It's even more difficult for the sisters because oftentimes they're not just black. They're women and they're in a world where they're being paid less for doing the exact same work and working 10 times as hard, if not more. And so oppression is a very serious matter. And so since I've made a determination in my mind that I'm going to be better, I'm going to change, I'm going to abreast myself with all the knowledge, not all the knowledge, as much of it as I can, central is the dean because the dean is going to help me keep things in their perspective. And so um, I'm able, again, like I said, when I went into these facilities, because um, when I came out here to Arizona, I immediately signed up at one of the local colleges for the criminal justice program. I graduated on the president's list <laughs> and I was a class mentor, alhamdulillah. And so when I went inside these facilities, um, the, juvenile, the, criminal, the juvenile detention facility, baby jails, I saw those little kids in there, little kids, eight years old, nine years old, in cells, in a cell, right? And it's like the normal activities going on. So my thing is, okay, who is the teachers around here? Where are they at? How, what education is being taught to the youth? Because I want to talk to that person. I received no answers. And I was at the Maricopa County uh, Juvenile Detention Center in Phoenix. Um, it's, a tough, it's a tough sled. It's a very serious fight. And um, I'm glad that the law has provided me with the ability to understand and to comprehend. And um, I don't do things just for the sake of doing them. There's always a purpose. And um, 3030, or not 3030, is it 3030? Where um, we are instructed to turn away from all that is wrong and, and turn towards what it is, what Allah has provided for us to be our, our purpose. And so my purpose is to, is to be better and to provide as much avail as I can in a righteous way with those who need it. Because in the time of Muhammad Sallallahu everybody wasn't a Muslim, as we all know. And the story of Abu Jahal 
it, it was talked, it was discussed previously. And I went back and I, I was watching it when it was happening, the, the conversation with the brothers. And so I think um, about Prophet Muhammad Salaam, when he was making Salah before he, before he left, and how he was in Salah, and they, 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 they put the, the, the camel guts, they threw him on his, while he was in the prayer, he wouldn't get up. He just stayed in that position. And um, I think of that. Because that's, that's, that's a serious matter right there. He was in Salah. And they did that. This is the Halal's message in Salah, or Spirit Allah. We take our Salah very serious. And so when we come to Salah, we don't want to hear, we don't want to hear a, a, a flat flutter past our ears. Because it's a distraction to us. He was in Salah, and they did that. And Alhamdulillah, we have that example and strength and, and not becoming angry. And that's something that we need to deal with. Not becoming angry. Because nobody wants to hear the angry black guy. We may have some people who want to get something done to that person, um, which would distract from the major issue at hand. And so we have in Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam an example of, of humility. And I recall when I first read The Life of the Prophet, um, the very first time I read that book, <laughs> I, um, I had a dream that night. <laughs> and in this dream, I was on a horse. I, I say it was a horseback. It could have been a camel, but I was, I was tied up. My bandits, they were they was they was flowing in the wind. And I, I I couldn't see any faces, but I was I was in I was I was part of the I was part of the group. And um we was going somewhere. I woke up, I was so happy. I, when I woke up that morning, I was just so happy. And so I knew what the dream was, and I wanted in. And so I've made every step that I could to, to get where I want to be, but I'm not through walking. There's many more steps to be taken. And so Allah will not change the condition of the people until they change themselves. And then um, if we get outside of what Allah has for us, you know, if, he, if, we, if we earn a reward, some say punishment, but if we earn it, we earn it. Whatever it may be, it's us taking those steps and being recompensed for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Brother Tabri, say something. Alhamdulillah, you know, um, I mean, I, I, I think, Alhamdulillah, like we're, we're touching on all of the points. Um, I think one of the most egregious, you know, problems with, um, you know, having been oppressed is that, you know, the Iman that we're talking about is not facilitated. So in other words, Abdul Muhaymin, you know, what, what, what you were just saying was, um, you know, a person has a responsibility to learn about what he owes Allah. That's his responsibility. Um, you know, he has a responsibility to, 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 to gain, you know, to know about the messengers of Allah, to know about the day of judgment, these things, right? Now, what, uh, what about a person who, because of his environment, he didn't learn how to read properly? because of his environment or you know, one of these young women was, you know, sexually trafficked and she's thoroughly traumatized. Right. And she has, she hasn't had any type of therapy. She hasn't had any type of counseling, you know? Um, I, I don't think that we should lose sight of the trauma that comes along the trauma that has to be uh, fixed before you say, listen, learn your far'ayn. Um, I mean, because it, the far'ayn, you're absolutely correct. You know, I mean, I just, I'm just thinking about, you know, what happens to all of these people who um, they don't read well. They're distracted because of hunger. They, uh, you know, they're distracted because, in other words, you know, they, 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 the oppression is still getting in the way, you know? The, uh, you know, the trauma is getting in the way. The abuse is getting in the way. Um, what do we, what, how do we deal with that? We're, you know, because, so, you know, I'm, I'm writing, actually writing my thesis on this. So I have a little bit of insight. 80% um, of, you know, men and women who are incarcerated report some type of traumatic event in their lives. I mean, this is serious, serious business. Because this is one of the reasons why the recidivism rate is so high. 
people go back to prison because the thing that took them there in the first place uh, has not been solved. You know, they, they go back into the same neighborhoods. They're dealing on the same level of anger. They're dealing at the same level of abuse. Um, and, and, and it takes them back into, um, you know, survival mode. And you cannot just give them a book on Akita and say, okay, now fend for yourself. No, right? we shouldn't do that. If anybody thinks that, I hope that's not the impression that I gave across. Right. That's where our job comes in at. That's where we're responsible. And far too often, this is where we have failed. You see what I'm saying? Because let's take, for instance, the reading issue. You know, we used to be on lockdown. Somebody would come to you and be like, hey, man, aren't y'all supposed to pray five times a day, whatever, whatever? Are you supposed to do this? You're supposed to do that? I'm like, yeah. And then you know how people are. They come with the little soft shoe telling the stuff. You're like, well, you know, I was like, so you think about what it is, who you sell is, or such and such. Okay, so you know what's going on. But then again, they take this to other people and like, again, we, we've seen it. Brothers get hard and you don't do this, you don't do that. But, but the thing is, going back to your point, is you recognize, I'd be like, well, you know, the brother ain't praying in the room because y'all give him all these books, the man can't read. You're not helping him. You're not teaching him how to say the prayer. You know, now again, we can't take all the responsibility off the individual because we know that they got, they know that they have certain things that they have to deal with. All of us knew that. And we have to take a certain bit of responsibility for ourselves. You know, traumatic experiences. I don't really want, I personally, I haven't got to the point where I could really share mine like that with people, but trust me, they're, they're there. I got quite a few of them to share one of these days. But uh, in terms of that, just like what you're talking about, I, I don't think, I come from a generation where if it means I got to hold you by your hand and walk with you all the way down the road until you feel comfortable going by yourself, then that's what I got to do. You know, I, 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 I've been told several times, and Sheikh Ramadan told me, and Gustav Lumumba that told me, and but it's, it's just me. They call me. I get a call at 3 o'clock in the morning from one of the students. I'm going to answer the phone from the ones who come home. I tell them, I, I don't care what you call me for. Call me. If I don't answer, just leave me a message and I'll call you as soon as I see it because I'm unable to just get to the phone because I don't screen phone calls. Just call me and I'll, I'll answer you. But because I, I recognize what's needed, you know, those are the times when a person is going to really need to talk to somebody because that might be that moment where, like, you know, that old flame might have seen you early in the night and she's calling you 2.30 in the morning and you're debating whether or not you're going to leave out at 3 to go see her or her. You see what I'm saying? Or your partner may have came along and he got something for you because he ain't seen you since you've been home. And it's like, hey, boy, here you go. What's, what's happening? And you ain't got no job. Child support got you in arrears for the 20, 30,000 because you've been gone for 15 years. You see what I'm saying? And it's like, huh, man, get yourself on your feet and you, what you going to do? You know what I'm saying? And like you say, a book of our kids is not going to solve that problem at that moment. That's our job. You know? But at the same time, <coughs> that being our job, we're looking at the example of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and recognizing how he dealt with the people. It was the example where the guy came and he said, asked about having, or the Sahaba rather, whoever he was, because we never got his name. I think there may have been some other commentary that talked about his name, but at the moment it's not coming to me and I don't recall anything of it. But he asked Rasulullah about praying five times a day. He just took his Shahada. He's like, no, I can't do that. <laughs> You know, he got the Shahada, so it was like, okay. And then it's like, I think he was, even in terms of the prayer, I think it was like from the five, he went down to like one or two a day. <laughs> and it was like, Shahada, after he walked off, it was like, who was that? <laughs> you know, you you let him do that, he's supposed to pray five times a day. And then, you know, the example Rasulullah gave him was like, hey, 
he committed himself to something that's going to take a, it's, it takes time for him to acclimate himself to being able to do these good things. Just like me. I took my shahad in 2004 and you can say roughly, although like I said, during that whole time I was doing everything I was supposed to do according to the law, may not have been according to the spirit of the dean, but it was according to the law. So it may have took me about five years to get myself to where I was like, I felt, although again, you know, I still got my mistakes and my issues, but it took me about five years to get my point myself to a point where I was like, okay, I got this. And it would, you know, when it came down to certain things that people would come to me and no, nah, I'm, I'm cool. I'm, I got this. Saying no was a firm no at that point. You know, before no was like, and, and you know, you might come back or you might dip back or whatever, but a firm nose came after four years till it's like the point, like the brother said, it's like, you couldn't pay me to go back out there and do those things. It's not going to happen. But fortunately enough for me, Allah guided me to that point because unfortunately, the learning experience I got being the time that I did, I didn't have nobody to hold my hand and walk for me as I was doing it. You see what I'm saying? But Allah gave me Tawfiq and he allowed me to experience some things and he gave me the ability to reflect on a lot of things and make some sound decisions. And Alhamdulillah, hopefully where I'm at now and where I'm going is something is in a state that he's pleased with. I'm not going to take no more. We have Sheikh Rami with us. You have anything you want to add, Sheikh? Wow, mashallah. I mean, there's a, a lot of different areas where we can go. Maybe if we could just finish up on, um, I think the thing that, that stands out for me the most, and thank you for sharing it, Fadler, was that little girl on the streets of Chicago. Um, and I think that that image really, really hits home because we can talk about oppression and the oppressors and oppressed people um, from from many different angles and, and the solutions. Um, but that, that girl stands out in my mind. And, and one of the things that you said that really that, that stands out for me is that you said, you know, we sowed the seeds of this oppression, you know, so maybe people weren't directly involved with that little girl standing on, on that corner, but they may have been indirectly involved um, in, in that process. And that's a question we have to ask ourselves. Well, how are we indirectly involved in a process of oppressions? For example, what, there's a documentary about uh, what's called blood chocolate. So a lot of people don't realize that there's still state slavery today in the in the chocolate, uh, the farms. And Al Jazeera has a, a documentary. It's about 10 years old now. Uh, but they actually go in with a hidden camera into a chocolate farm, a cocoa farm. And they tell the guy, do you have any kids I can buy that are about three or four hundred dollars? And he said, yeah, I got somebody. So then you have to ask, well, in, in me buying chocolate, that's why you have to look at like, what is the sources of this chocolate? Am I, am I feeding into this? Yesterday was tax day. You know, as I'm sealing the envelope to pay my taxes to the U.S. government, I said, Astaghfirullah, you know, we're going to be asked about this on Yom Al-Qiyamah because we know over 40 cents or maybe it's over 50 cents of every dollar is spent on the mil military. So for me, it's like I had to renew yesterday, renew my intentions. Why am I here on this land? Uh, if I'm paying, if I'm paying that, those taxes to that government on Yom Al-Qiyamah, Allah is going to ask you, did you have a need to be here? Um, and, and, and I have to be thinking about Dawa, I have to be helping people. Otherwise, pack up and make hijrah, go to a Muslim country where I don't have to su support a U.S. military that's doing all of these things. Um, I don't want to take, take the conversation, but it just make, you know, asking us how are we indirectly involved. And then Tabari um, talked about his, his thesis. And for our listeners who, who might not be aware, Tabari's uh, pursuing a, a master's in social work. And we're really proud of, of him going into that program. And, and inshallah, once he graduates, he will be Taiba's first staff clinician uh, to be actually able to, uh, he's already doing the internship hours, but he will be our first um, licensed clinician uh, on staff that has a, a, an ex experiential knowledge of being formerly incarcerated. But Tabari brought up a really good point that it's not only it's not only the people in that neighborhood that might have have had have sown some of those seeds, Father, like that you have said. There's these other uh, these other factors, and maybe even dating back to uh, slavery. So, for example, that young girl and her mother 
if if they if they didn't have slavery in their history, how would that have changed? Uh, you know, ch impact because the breakup of the family and the intergenerational poverty that they're experiencing and the, 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 the pharaonic ways of slaying the boys and, and letting the women live and, you know, creating the systems. So we have to look at like that little girl. Cause at first I'm, I started thinking to myself, man, why does her mom do that to her? But who knows, maybe her mother was oppressed in that same way. And so her, her brain even developed to where in a limited uh, focus, like that's the way it's going to be. So, um, Father, if you could give us some thoughts on like, okay, as an individual in this whole, and that's what, oh, that's what I was going to say for the social workers. They don't look just at the inv individual, right? Buddy? They look at the whole society. How are all of these factors, uh, media, school, family, religion, how is that affecting the individual? And so at the end of the day, we know we don't have control over all of those things. Um, but how can we make sure to not lose sight of that, the grand scheme of what might be affecting and then our own individual influence on those systems and then say, okay, I can be an oppressor and oppressed at the same time. And, and how do I balance that? Like you said, Father, you said your wife says, you know, uh, reminds you, you can't save the world. So maybe if you could just give us some parting advice uh, to us, uh, yeah. you know, to yourself and to us and to the, the, the viewers who are watching this live or in the future, just some advice on how to balance uh, those realities and what you can, what we can each do. Come to that. So um, a thought occurred to me earlier and, and it wasn't connected with what I shared, the young girl and her mother, but something um, that struck me years ago um, when I took Sahada. And it was the AI, when uh, we are instructed, when we're advised, we see the sign that Allah is going to ask the little girl for what crime was she killed. So she's going to be asked that. I, I, in my mind, she's going to have to provide an answer. And so the truth that day will become manifest. For what crime was she killed? Who had a hand up to the point where she was killed? What took place? What, what happened before then? So the level of trauma that she experienced was the result of someone else's trauma. And so traumas are different levels, different levels of trauma. As you mentioned, as the brother mentioned earlier, um, there was a point in time where there was a disparity with um, 500 would get you this much amount of time and five rounds would get you this amount of time. And so that trauma led to another trauma. So we have to be mindful, we have to be cognizant of the things that we say, the things that we put into our, into our mouths because if we don't control what we put into us, we won't have any control of what comes out of us. And so it's my hope, by example, to keep the being first and to know that for every step that I take, I'm going to have to answer for it. And so being, being mindful of what I have experienced as it relates to oppression, I take it in my heart that I'm not going to apply those same oppressive behaviors to anyone else. And so I have to continuously, I have to, I have to continuously read, I have to continuously read so that I won't forget. Um, Imam Bazali and one of the hadiths, he mentioned that um, he was on the road and, um, and he was in the robber came, approached him and he took his books and he was like, I'll take my books. This is my knowledge. And he asked him, well, if they so, if they so precious to you, then how can I take it? And from that point on, um, the memorization came to be, it was, it was more um, enforced, not enforced, but it was more advised. And that was one of the first lessons I got when I started studying with Taylor, the memorization <laughs> and how, um, and I was like, I can I write all this stuff there? This is a lot. And so it made sense to me. And to this day, I share that with the kids in the house that if you want to remember something and have a good, a good um, recall of it, put it in your own handwriting. So that way you can be accountable for what you're putting in, what you're putting out. This is your work. This is what you're doing. And so that is what I could advise people to do is to remember your works by keeping stock, taking stock of what you're doing. If you need to write a journal, I come to do that. Write it down. But what I do recommend is that for the brothers and sisters who we share this with that are on the other side still, um, we need to put together and the rap plan that we went through the studies of it, a wellness recovery, 
action plan. And as me and the discussed before, I didn't know what the rap was. But me and my sister had a conversation like seven or eight years ago. And she asked me, what's your plan of action? And I thought about it. I didn't answer right at that moment, but I thought about it. And I had to come up with some tools for success that I thought would lead to my success. And so I wrote a few things down, but I wrote them down. And then I memorized it because I got to act this out now. And so the, the, the paperwork is no longer in existence, but I have the example in my heart and I speak these words into others so that inshallah, they'll be able to um, take it, what I'm saying as serious because I don't just talk this talk. Um, I make a real song ever to walk it. Being raised upright, independent, and fearless, I, um, I still hold the mark, that mark to this day, but not in an arrogant way, not in a conceited way. I make a real effort to be as humble as possible because I know I don't know everything. And I sincerely hope that for those who need assistance, um, that they ask for it. Because as, already, as you mentioned, um, I recall um, helping the brothers because we started a tutorial program um, against all lives because we felt that the generation from behind us, they needed some assistance. And so I met a brother one day, and uh, I, don't, I can't recall his name, but I remember the experience. Um, he was having a difficulty spelling, saying a word. So we went back to the basics. And I determined that I knew the brother, he was, he was illiterate. And so I remember the Sesame Street, you know, the two monsters, one on this side, one on this side. And you, put them, you put it together. And we did that. And heavenly lot, the brother was so happy. Um, the word we spelled was meat, M-E-A-T. But he, he, couldn't, he didn't understand what it was when I first saw it to him. But we came together by Allah's leave and we, got, we, we put it together. And so I didn't judge, but I didn't, I didn't throw it in his face because he was, he was a young guy. He was, uh, he, was, he, was, he was looked upon as a leader in his organization, but he couldn't read. And so I knew it was, a, it was to him, it was a level of shame because of his behavior. And so some of the traumas that people act out are because of levels of internal thing that they have that people don't rarely know. And um, I was trusted. I became entrusted with a lot of information from a lot of different people because I was a true confidant. They knew they come to me with anything of any kind. Um, it would stay between us. So I share that. Be true to who you are as a person. Be true to the level of trust that's instilled or provided to you from your fellow brother or sister because they're coming to you for a reason. And be the message that you bring. Don't just say, um, you know, there's no God with a lot of homeless messages. And then you're talking about something that's, that's, that's unbefitting of the being. We know what we believe in as Muslims. We can't add to it. We can't take it away from it. And so for those who are uh, want to walk um, or stand shoulder to shoulder, and there was a big discussion about that toe to toe as well, but everybody's different. Some people feel are longer than others, so shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> we'll just stick with the shoulders. Um, Islam is a beautiful thing. And irrespective of what others may try to say, we know the truth. And it's our job to speak the truth to power. Because oftentimes power has a way of distorting things historically and in the present. And as long as I have a breath, I'm going to be um, an advocate not only for myself and for my family, but for those who don't know that they have a voice. And um, they know that they got a brother in me wherever I'm at. I'm the same way. Just call me. Just call me. I'll, I'll answer. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Just call me. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah, well, thank you. That was uh, beautiful advice. I think we're going to uh, that definitely needs to be um, uh, highlighted about uh, reading and writing. And it gave me insight. Um, and I got, uh, I, I developed more insight. And that's, I think, one of the themes that, that, that I'm getting out of this whole series. I got more insight about, into the Quran. Uh, like you, you, you talked about those two, the two farmers and them talking about their, their, their garden. Uh, but, but thank you so much, Fadlan, for, for, for being on the panel. Um, and uh, thank you to all of our, our listeners, for everybody who, who, who joined in. And we look forward, inshallah, once the COVID situation is over, you can come out here to California and visit us. Or we'll head out to, to Arizona once it cools off a little bit. <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> all right, mashallah. Well, thank you again, Tafadlan. And uh, we'll say maybe you could close us out with a dua, and we'll say uh, we'll, we'll close it out. Well, awesome. إن الإنسان لا في حس إلا الذين أمنوا وعملوا الصالح وتوسّل بالحق وتوسّل بالصلب الحمد لله. We truly do pray that Allah bestow upon each and every brother on this panel 
the sister as well. Thank you, sister, <laughs> for all that you've done. Table has made a big, a big, um, it's, a big it's, it's important to me. It's important to me. I've come a long way. And my wife always encourages me um, to stick with it and know that she speaks highly of the shape, even though she has, hasn't met you yet, but inshallah, she was, we almost came to Oakland before the COVID took, came around. But <laughs> I'm, look, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting her and, and the rest of the brothers as well. Inshallah, I'm doing payment. You can come back this way. I don't know about Jordan's. They said, y'all on lockdown too. So. <laughs> inshallah, yeah. Well, Inshallah, you can come out and uh, you and your wife to the Bay Area and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll show you around all the sites and you get to meet everybody out here. Okay. Yeah, all right. Want to give Assalamu alaikum. alaikum. Uh, she asked some information about your nonprofit, Brother Fubba. So we'll get whatever relevant information you have to share and we'll put it in the uh, chat for Facebook under the uh, video, and you can be able to find it there later, inshallah. Yeah. Do you have, if, Father, do you have a, you, you have a website, right? Yes, I'm, I, I had parked I was updating it, so I have one, yes. I'll provide okay. it with that. Basically. Yeah, if you, um, you, uh, is this, um, w uh, will it be, um, is your options unlimited, this, this Facebook is yours? Yeah, this is yours. Yeah. So I'll have, put this in the chat for, for the sister, and, um, and then we'll also put it on, uh, on, on, on Taba's Facebook as well. Um, and it should have the uh, it should have the information as well. All right. Thank you to everybody. Yeah. Is this right? Okay. Yes. It's your options are limited. Yeah. It's uh, your options unlimited, and and you got your uh, website as well here. Yeah. So so you looks like you're working on the on the website on updating yes. it. But I just put in the the Facebook page because it has the link to your 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 nonprofit. It also has your um, uh, the, the email and uh, has information, you know, pictures and so forth about some of the uh, some of the works that, uh, that you're doing. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank okay, thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Wa alaikum